worshipped you, but I, I just, man, I was worshiping today. I mean, I worship, but sometimes, you know, you just, you press in. You know, and every time you lean into God, God responds. I've noticed that. James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I am so thankful for the presence of God. I'm just so thankful. I need his presence. I need it. And I don't know uh, how people do it, you know, who don't live for God, who don't, who don't pray and who don't. I mean, I mean, uh, how do you survive? I mean, you, I know that we got to pray in church. We got praying people. But how, how in the world do people make it? If they don't have Jesus, wow, you know? So, anyway, I'm thankful for the presence of the Lord, and we're going to do our best to win people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, and, and uh, we're just going to, I'm going to open in a word of prayer. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word. Your word is truth, it's life, it's breath, it's what we need. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, we just pray, oh God, that you'd be with us this morning, that your presence would be in this place, that Lord, as we've drawn near to you, as we've worshipped you, you will draw near to us, and when you're in our presence, that's when we can be healed, and we can be emotionally healed, and physically healed, and, and Lord, you could just, you could bless us, and we give you praise in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Luke chapter 14, the um, English Standard Version says it like this, verse 23. Are you there? And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Last weekend was the weekend that everything changed. Everything changed. It was Easter weekend. It was the, it was the weekend that there was a shift in history. Not, I'm not talking about last week, a week ago, but I'm talking about 2,000 years ago on Resurrection Sunday. Everything shifted. Everything in history. I mean, I, I'm no longer at a distance from God. I mean, I, I have the ability to have access to God and His presence. I have Jesus living inside of me. I have His presence. I mean, literally... Last weekend, the weekend of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything shifted. And I know 2,000 years ago, you know, after the cross, today we, we kind of take things for granted, you know, but you think about it. What happened 2,000 years ago last week literally split time. It shifted the way that we engage with God. And we don't have to offer live animal sacrifices anymore. We don't have to be disconnected from God because of sin. But now we can have a a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, I just love God. Don't you just love him? I am so in love with Jesus. You know, I mean, do you realize that the moment that sin came into the world, God already had a plan to redeem man. He already had the plan in place. When man sinned, God wasn't up in heaven going, oh, man, I better get a game plan together. Man messed up my plans. No, God already had a plan. God already knew that we were going to mess up from the very beginning that when man sinned, he had a plan already in motion. When the moment Adam and Eve, you know, when they felt the effects of sin and shame, what they do? They went and covered themselves with leaves. But God created a covering out of animal skins for them. In, in what that was, that covering of animal skins, God went and killed an animal, shed blood to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame. I mean, so Jesus was already being foreshadowed. It was the ultimate Lamb of God. Who Jesus was the ultimate Lamb of God. He would be the ultimate sacrifice to cover our sin, to cover our shame. Jesus going to the cross was never an afterthought. From the foundations of the earth, God's, His plan was to send Jesus to be crucified and slain for our sin and raise, up, raise Him up from the dead. Last weekend, man, it just changed everything. Whew. But I want to remind you of something. Sadly, not everyone knows 
of the hope that we've experienced and what we celebrated last week, the resurrection of Jesus. Not everyone is familiar with the grace of Jesus. There are people who have not been introduced to the hope of Jesus yet. So what that means is that we have a mission. We have a mission to accomplish. There are people that we know who don't know that there is a God who loves them. There are people that we know that aren't experiencing the freedom that we received from Christ. That there's people, I mean, that there, Jesus paid the price. They, people don't know that Jesus paid for their sin on the cross. There are people who don't know. Jesus said, in verse, Luke 14, 23, And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Compel them to come in so my house can be full. Full. Do you know that God wants His house full? Come on, do you know that? God wants His house full. The Bible declares that God doesn't want anyone to perish. That He wants everybody to get an invitation. This text in Luke chapter 14 is a story of this ultimate feast. It's the supper of the Lamb. It represents the marriage supper of the Lamb. and The final moment when, when we're all with God in heaven and for seven years celebration, we're going to be celebrating while the earth is being prepared for us to come back and live for a thousand years. And it's kind of a, the story is a foreshadowing. It's that moment God was saying, this is the moment that I want everybody there. I don't want anyone to miss out on this feast on this great meal, this celebration, the, the wedding celebration, because Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride and we're going to have a great wedding and a great feast and a great party and it's going to take seven years to celebrate. Amen. And Jesus doesn't want anyone to miss out. So in the story it says they go out and they invite a bunch of people, but there's still room. And he sends them out again, and this time he says, I want you to go to the highways and the byways. Go everywhere. Go to the rich and the poor. Go to those that are healed and those that are sick. Go everywhere and bring them so my house can be full. That's the heart of God. That's the vision that God has given this church, that we fill God's house. Why do we want to fill it up? Pastor, you just want a big church. You better believe it. I want every seat filled. I want people stacking up outside, looking in the windows. Because I want people to know about the love of Jesus Christ, the hope of Jesus Christ, how He can change lives. You better believe it. And I tell you what, if the church got so full we couldn't get them in, we would do it again. And if we had to, I would preach ten times on a Sunday to get them all in. Hallelujah. Have you ever been, have you ever had to put a party together? So maybe a wedding or an event? And you had to start making the list of who's going to get an invitation, right? Who's going to get the invitation and who's not? Come on, you know you've had to do that, Right? Let's say, no, no, we don't want to invite them. But yeah, these guys we want to invite, right? I mean, and, and so, you, you know, it's a, you, you make this big list and you start crossing off. After you make the list, you start crossing off the people that, you know, and we're not going to invite them. Maybe you got space issues, you know. Maybe, you know, you're thinking, well, if everybody comes, you know, the house is going to be too full. I know Sarah, it was her birthday. And it was also the double lung transplant party, you know, one year anniversary. They say that uh, uh, 10 percent of the people who have a transplant don't even live for a whole year. She made it the first year. They're saying 75 percent of people uh, only make it to three. You know, but she was there, but you know she invited 300 people to her party, and the building only sat 133. 
what would she have done? She would have broken the fire code if everybody would have came. You know? But so, so, you know, how many of you know that, uh, have you ever been, uh, uh, you know, when you were a kid, your parents said, okay, we're going to give you a birthday party, but you only can invite two friends. Huh. Right? And, you know, how many of you know that there's really not much difference between 6 and 60? The chaos level is the same, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. And I'm thankful that I, w- I got on the list. I'm so thankful that I was invited and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I want my house to be full. And that means that you and I were invited. We got invited. Our name was on the list. Whoa! We were included. Every single one of us are here today because someone included us. Someone invited us. Somebody brought us close to Jesus and we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We're here today because we were included. My message today is called Includers. I want us to be includers. I want us to include people. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. God is the ultimate includer. There's nobody that God has predetermined to be off the guest list. He has included every single person on this planet. Every person. That means that somebody somewhere gave you and extended an invitation to you and you accepted and you're here today. We've been invited by someone along the way. We're not just a stepchild. We're not the annoying neighbor kid who's been invited for dinner. We have been adopted into the family of God. We are fully included with all the family rights. How many of you know that if the, if the neighbor kid shows up, there are certain places in the house that they're not allowed to go? But your kids can go anywhere in the house. Come on. We're not just the neighbor kid. God included us in the family. Hallelujah. We got the invitation. I mean, this is really, this is an un unbelievable reality for you and me that we were distant we were disconnected but God brought us close God included us we've been invited included who are we including who do we include we rub shoulders with friends and family and worker, co-workers and students at school. And I'm sure you can tell those that don't know Jesus. I, you can tell those who, are, who haven't been on the list. Who are we including? Who? Are you including other people? You see, you and me, we've, we've been invited to be close, but who are we extending that same invitation to? Who are we reaching out to? 2 Corinthians says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Do you know how we're going to reach Tacoma? you know how God's going to reach Tacoma? Pierce County? Through you. Don't, don't roll your eyes through you. No, preacher, pastor, you're, you're the one. No, it's through you. Through you. We are the church. We are an extension of heaven. We are the body of Christ. God will make his appeal to the planet through you and me. It's through you and me. That's how the invitation gets out. The guest list doesn't stop right here. The reality is, the list could stop right here if we let it. This is it. No more. We're in. Nobody else can come because they're either too bad or they're they're not pretty enough or they don't smell right, they don't act right because we want conservatives. No, we want liberals. No, we want independents. You voted for who? No, we need to be 
includers. We got to keep the invitations going. Can we? Can we make a list? Can we share an invitation? Can we go and say, hey, you're on the list. What are you talking about? You're included. What? Yeah, I want, I'll pick you up Sunday morning. I'll be there. I'll pick you up, and you're, you're included. You're on the guest list. So how many of you know that people want to be included? Hmm? You're invited to the marriage feast of all time. You're included. God doesn't want anybody to be left out. We've been included. Now we have to include others. I'm very thankful that I had the awesome privilege to grow up in my parents' home. I mean, they're legit. I mean, they truly love Jesus, and they modeled that from childhood up to love Jesus. They taught us from childhood up to tithe. They taught us from childhood up to pray. They, I mean, my, one of my dad, when I was in high school, I had all these problems that teenagers have in high school. And I'm like, Dad, I've got all these issues and problems, and I need some counsel. I need some advice. And here's the advice he gave me. Son, you need to pray about it. Finally, after years of him saying, Son, you need to pray about it, I'm like, I don't want to pray about it. I want you to tell me. I can't tell you, son, you need to pray about it. The best advice. I mean, I finally, after about 15 times he told me that, I actually tried it. And it worked. Oh, I love Jesus. I, because of my parents, I, because of my heritage. I have had the privilege to serve Jesus most of my life and preach this gospel for over 30 years. My grandfather Davis was a first-generation Christian. He was the first person to get saved in my lineage. Grandpa Davis, first-generation Christian. He was the one who changed the course for generations in our family. Grandma Cummins, on the other side of the family, was she was a praying grandma. Thank you, Jesus, for praying grandparents. I mean, Grandma was in, late in life. She needed help, and she was getting older, and she couldn't do things, and so she needed help doing some of the tasks, and my dad was there to help her out, and, and he looked down and saw her knees because she always wore a dress down below. You never saw her knees. She was so, so conservative that she would cover her. You couldn't even see her knees, and if you saw her knees, she felt she had just been exposed. Well, Dad saw her knees, and when he saw her knees, he noticed there's these great large calluses on her knees. And he said, Mother, what is wrong with your knees? She goes, oh, those are my prayer bones. She spent so many hours on her knees that she literally had giant calluses built up on her knees. We had praying grandparents. And partly because of that, me and my four siblings are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Someone was an includer in my life. I am so thankful that my grandparents served Jesus. I'm so thankful that my parents served Jesus. Now, my generation, we need to step up and serve Jesus and be an includer. And then my children's generation, being able to serve Jesus. And then down to the next generation, five generations of Christians now in my family because Grandpa and Grandma got an invitation. You know, I had a, an evangelist came to our church. We were helping pioneer a little church in downtown Baton Rouge. And he came to preach. And I disgusted him for some reason. He didn't like me. See, he came from a pretty bad background. He was a sailor, you know, a Navy man, and he cussed a lot, and he was mean and, and then he was a rodeo guy and so he was a rodeoer you know and, and one day he got saved and God saved him and even as a Christian he was rough as a corn cob and he looked at me and he says you know what boy he said you were your daddy was a preacher your granddaddy was a preacher you have no idea how hard it is out there in the world you were handed Christianity on a silver platter like I was some kid from privilege. 
And he goes, you have no idea the grace of God and how God has redeemed me, the filth of the planet, and redeemed me and brought me back to Christ. And the Lord just quickened me right at that moment. I looked at him and I said, brother, the same Jesus that saved you from all of that kept me from it. And he stopped and he says, I am so sorry. You have the greater testimony. Let me tell you something. You can change the destiny of your family. You can change the lineage of your family when you dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You raise your kids up in the Word of God. You raise your kids up in church. You raise them up believing in Jesus Christ. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. I know that to be true. I know sometimes our kids, they run astray. God brings them back. Come on, parents, if your kids are wayward right now, don't you forget that. You taught them about Jesus Christ. They know Jesus Christ. They know better. They'll be back. They will be back. I'm just saying, somebody included my grandfather. Somebody included my grandmother. And the trajectory of my family has been changed because somebody took the time to include them. Because of the life-changing events that took place over 2,000 years ago last week. We have an opportunity to reach out and include people of Tacoma and Pierce County and get them on the list. They need to know that they are included, that they are on the list. They are invited. Your invitation, you being an includer, is the beginning of somebody's story shifting. Someone's family lines are going to start shifting because you included them. I know the opposite. I know people, generations, they didn't serve God. Because they didn't serve God, now their kids don't serve God. And their grandkids don't serve God. And they've been in and out of jail and in and out of prison. They've, they've caused all kinds of problems in society. Don't you want to have a lineage? Don't you want to start somebody on a lineage, a, a new trajectory, that there will be people that contribute to society instead of people that, that cause problems in society? Don't, wouldn't you love to be able to say, my daddy served God. My granddaddy served God. I mean, that's a privilege. I'm not, I don't want you to take it wrong. Because if you say, well, man, I didn't, you can start it today with you. You start a new line. Who knows that when you, when you go get that coffee in the morning, that girl who makes you the coffee every morning and she even knows what, what you like before you get there? Yeah. That co-worker that you work with, that kid at school that you go to school with, they might have a praying grandma out there that is praying that someone would include them, that their granddaughter or their grandson, would somebody would bring them to church so that they could get close to Jesus. We could be that. We could be that. We could be the includer. We could be the invitation. I realize that the word includer is not a real word. But it seems the best verb form of the word include. So let's be includers. Let's include people. Abundant life, we should be the most inclusive group in this city. When they come to our church, no matter who they are or what they look like or what their story is or, or, or when they walk in this place, they feel like they're part of the family. They're included. They feel loved. They feel welcome. That's what the church is supposed to be. God designed us to appeal to the humanity for Jesus. It's through us. Jesus uses you and me. What a privilege that we actually get to go and be an extension of Jesus Christ to the earth. I mean, we get to be, we get to give the invitations. See, something happens when we begin to include people. It does something internally in us that shifts everything. 
Have you ever experienced not being invited to something? <laughs> Social media is great about reminding us of things that we did not get invited to, right? Right? I mean, many of you are way cooler than me, and you probably get invited to everything, right? And, and then you see a photo of yourself on Facebook, and you see all your homies at a special event, and you're not in the picture. And so you're like, well, where's my invite? How come I wasn't invited? Then you passively, aggressively make a comment on the photo that says, nice photo of you and your friends. <laughs> Right? I mean, I see this all the time. You know? Well, if jerks weren't in my life, you know, I mean, I mean, people just, it's a random thing, you know, so 100,000 people out there going, was it me? Am I the jerk? What? Right? Sometimes Facebook should be hurt book. Because they hurt people. You know? <laughs> then you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's the worst not being included and invited to stuff. And how does it feel when you're added to the list. You've been invited. Right? I want to talk about the power of inclusion and what that does for our lives. Number one, when you're being included in something, number one, it provides identity for people. Being a group of includers provides people with identity. Ephesians chapter 1 Verse 5 said, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. That's the heart of God, to bring us close. God wants to bring us close to Him. We were distant, but everything God has done has been done to bring us close to Him. God desired to adopt us into His family. We get our identity with the name of Jesus. You know, your family name, it carries a brand. You know, I mean, you know, Cummins. I mean, what do you think of when you, when you hear the name Cummins? Do you think of the scum of the earth who've been in and out of prisons and, and, and they're just, they're raping and pillaging and they're, they're arr, you know, they're pirates, you know? I hope not. I hope you say Cummins. Oh, those are the people, you know, or all the preachers in, you know, I mean, Hopefully, they're good people, and you got a good name, right? I mean, our name brands us. Escobedo. Right? Harney. I mean, Myers. I mean, you go through Vanderhoff. Everybody knows Vanderhoff. If you don't know a Vanderhoff, I mean, man, Vanderhoffs are everywhere. We sold a boat to buy this microphone. Somebody donated a boat to the church and said, here, I know you need a microphone. I will donate my boat. You sell the boat. Buy yourself a microphone. $600 for one microphone. Yes, because the cheap ones sound bad. And so guess who came and bought the boat? A Vanderhoff, his uncle, bought a boat. I mean, right, the, the, the name. We're branded by our name. You know, I mean, what do you want people to know about your name? When I, when I say Steve Allen, did you know that there's a pastor, Steve Allen, going to Trinity? And so sometimes when I say Steve Allen, they'll say, which one? Because one is better than the other. We got the good one. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Could you imagine if they were both here? Hey, Pastor Steve Allen, Pastor, Pastor, must be Pastor Steve Allen Sr. and Pastor Steve Allen the Jr. And they're not even related. I don't know. <clears throat> Are you? No? Okay. Not that he knows of. Right? I mean, so many have these broken identities, broken situations. Difficult and dysfunctional families, you know, and we, when we invite people in and they become a part of the church, part of the church family, they, they become followers of Jesus Christ, and it's amazing how they, their identity shifts. Wow, you remember back in the day when they were really a loser, but when they came to Jesus, now they're, they're like, amazing, what happened? 
I tell you, when you get attached to something, when you've been invited, when you've been included, and when Jesus comes in, he transforms your life. And he makes you something amazing. This world that we live in is a world of chaos. We've, we've forgotten, the world has forgotten that they have a father that loves them, that, that cares about them, that, that designed them intentionally. People are, are dysfunctional because they're confused and unsure of their value. There was a survey that went out a few years ago, and it was only two questions. And it was number one, do you believe that there is a God? And number two, do you believe he has a plan for you? What was interesting is how many people in America said that they believed that there was a God? A lot of people believe that there is a God. The second question was very sad. It said, do you believe God has a plan for you? And most of them said they don't think God is interested in their life. They say, well, God cares about the planet, you know, but he doesn't really have time for me. You think because, you know, I have, uh, God doesn't have any personal interest in me. And a lot of them feel this way. They believe that, that there's a God up there, but... <clears throat> he's probably mad at me because I've made bad decisions. I've made poor choices, and, and I've messed up my life. You know, we have the privilege of helping people understand that that's not the case, that God loves them. We get to help people understand that they have a Father in heaven that is so completely committed to you and your life that it's amazing what God, how He wants to draw you in. And when you realize you have someone who believes in you and cares about you, it changes your confidence. It changes your strength. I mean... When my grandson's out there and he's playing soccer and he falls down and he's hurting and he's like, you know, he's like, uh, uh, uh. and you're like, come on, buddy, you can do it. And all of a sudden he's like, he gets, goes right, right? How many of you know that to be true? How many of you becomes a little Superman on the field? Right? I mean, this, name a, name a, a body part. A hand. Okay. I got some stickers here. I want you to just use your hand. Not your fingers. Nothing else. Just use your hand. And I want you to peel a sticker off of here. Doesn't work. All right. My, I asked this to my grandson. I said, name a body part that's really important. He goes, my back. Oh, the back is great. I mean, none of us would be able to do anything without a back. I said, but I want you to peel one of these stickers off with your back. Looking at me like, Papa, you have lost your mind. I looked at Elijah. I said, well, peel me off a sticker. Name a body part. He goes, oh, my leg. And I'm like, yeah, legs, man. Without a leg, we, could, we wouldn't be able to stand. We wouldn't be able to walk. We wouldn't be able to peel a sticker off with your leg. I go, no, you can't. So some people in the body of Christ, they're like, I am so insignificant. I am so nothing. I am just fingertips. That's all I am. Guess what you need? Fingertips to do that job. Every single one of us is part of the body of Christ. We all have a function in the body. And yes, the leg is important. The hand is important. The hands are good for clapping, high five, handshake. There's a lot of good functions for the hand. The hand can it supports. The fingers. I mean, where would your fingers be if you didn't have a hand? You wouldn't have any, right? And it, all, it takes all of us as part of the body, all of us doing our part in order to do some of the delicate, most delicate things that God wants us to do, right? We all have incredible value, and when we Pull it together. We have strength. I tell my kids all the time, my grandkids and my son, I say, hey, I love you. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. You're awesome. 
Do you know what that does to a kid when they get that affirmation from their father? Oh, sweetie, you are just beautiful. My granddaughter just loves that. Man, how did you get so beautiful? You know, and sometimes they're like, well, you know, I, I brushed my hair. You know, I'm like, I mean, she could get out of bed with her hair like that, and she's still gorgeous, right? I mean, we include people. We bring them into a conversation. We provide an opportunity for people to get rest- restoration and, and find out who they are. And to get their value so they can be a part of the body. Another thing that inclusion does is, number, number two, is it provides stability. See, when we have all this chaos all around us, those people who are oh, messed up and their world is falling apart, they need somebody who's got some stability. We need a, they need a healthy family. A healthy family provides stability in the middle of a storm. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 talks about how two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone. When he falls, he does not have anyone to help lift him up. We have an epidemic of people falling with nobody there to help them. They're disconnected. They're, They're out of the circle. They are out of the family. And if we include people, we help provide stability for people who are facing all kinds of stuff. And we can stand with them and we can say, hey, I've got you. I've got you. You can provide stability for people when, when you bring them close. It's a powerful opportunity to love people that way. And then here's number three. When we include people, it also provides purpose. Inclusion provides purpose. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body of Christ that, that the, the term that's the term the Bible uses to describe the church, the body of Christ. The church is not just an organization. It's not just a business. It's a community. It's a family. It's not a building. But we all are the church and we all go, we take it with us on Monday. We take the church with us all the way through Saturday. Monday through Saturday, we take it with us, and we take it to the streets, we take it to school, we take it to work with us. It goes wherever we go, and that is how we expand and grow God's house, the kingdom of God. Each one of us, we have a purpose, and a part, a piece, but we get our value when we're connected to the whole. If I cut your finger off and lay it on the floor, that finger is going to be worthless unless it's connected to the body. The problem is that too many people are trying to find their purpose alone and by themselves, and it's it's impossible. My value is attached to the collective value of all of us together. Could you imagine me in this building alone? Nobody to preach to? Wow, (laughs) that'd be pretty boring to listen to myself. You know, I do what I do, you do what you do, but we all do it, and we do our thing. I was just talking to the ladies this morning. I was just bragging on on the hospitality team. I mean, how they have blossomed. You know, don't take this wrong, don't be offended, but I'm just going to say this. For the sake of my illustration, people who are not connected barely make it on time or they're late. But people who have a purpose, they'll be here. These gals who maybe they didn't show up half the time in the past or they came late or whatever, now they're here at 8 o'clock in the morning. What are they doing at 8 o'clock in the morning? Church doesn't even start till 10. Let me tell you what. They're making sure that there are baked goods. They're making sure that there's coffee made. They're setting the the tables up. They're putting stuff around the church. They're getting things ready. And you know what? They become social butterflies. They're just like, they're just there. They're on high heaven, man. You're like, and what? Who could possibly be happy at getting to church two hours early? 
I'm here, but I have a purpose. Doreen's here. She's got a purpose. Dottie's here. I mean, you know what happened? One time Dottie didn't show up for church because she was on vacation. It was a Wednesday night. She wasn't, and we were doing youth on Wednesday nights. And Ricky was the youth pastor, and, and, and next thing you know, Ricky comes in, you know, and he's, down, he's been downstairs for hours, you know, and next thing you know, he's like, man, it's 7 o'clock. Where's all the teenagers? So he's like, Psh. he starts to walk upstairs all dejected and down and up and messed up, and he comes upstairs, and there's all the teenagers standing outside the building because the doors were still locked. Ricky's never had to open the door. Dottie always did it, Right? Dottie's like, well, finally somebody noticed that I actually do something around here, right? How many of you know that Dottie does something around here? Yeah, woo, she's like the glue, holds the place together. Oh, my goodness. I am loved personally by God, but I am part of, the, of a body that has a unique function, and I play a role in that. Many are confused, and they don't realize that God has a bigger purpose for their life. But you can't fulfill your purpose disconnected from the body. My ears, my feet, knees, as much as they ache sometimes, they're all valuable. But alone, they can't function to their potential. They have to be connected. Alone, they'd always have the question, What's my design? What's my purpose? Here I am. I'm this, this fingertip. I don't even know what my purpose is. I'm useless. Why did God do this to me? Who am I? What am I? Why was I born? Connected to the body? Oh, Now I've got purpose. Now we know. Purple. You're blue. Yeah. Now I have a function. Now that simple little act of inclusion, you're included. You're on the team. Right? You're a part. You're included. I'm needed. Now I know I've got a function. I'm, that's why we do growth track two. Find out what your personality type is. Find out what your gifting is. Find out what your passion is. And when we find that out, I was just talking to a, a girl last night used to come to our church. Her name is Karina Westover. Remember, remember Karina? Dave and Karina? And uh, I know back in the day she wanted to do children's ministry. And I just like... I don't know why, but I'm just, I didn't know why. I didn't even understand it. We didn't even do personality stuff back then. And, but so we chose somebody else, and they were like, they didn't pick me. But you know what? Her gifting wasn't children. Even though she loved children, she liked doing children, but it wasn't her gift. Her gift was hospitality. So last night, we're just at that party, and she was there. And what do you think she was doing? I'm sitting there doing my gift. I'm just talking to everybody. Karina's up there, and she's, oh, she sees cookies are missing. She's up there, and she's setting out the cookies. And she's just going, whoosh. She's having a blast setting out cookies. I'm going, well, that ain't my job. But that's not my passion. You want a cookie? They're in the cupboard. You don't want me on a hospitality team. No, you want Doreen. You, you want, yeah, you want Chris. <laughs> Those are the people you want. <laughs> I do what I do. My wife's like, there you were over there yakking away. Yeah, I had a whole audience of people standing all around me as we're talking. Because that's what I do. I'm a blabbermouth. I just, right? Who I am, who you are, strengthens the body. And we can make a difference in our city, in our country, in our county when we do it. Together. I'm almost done. I'm finishing. You can come to the music. What an opportunity we have to be includers. What a privilege we have to be an extension of Jesus. Are we?
Are we making ourselves available to allow Jesus to work through us? Are we, are we going to allow God to use us this week? Are we going to allow our social media to bring glory to God? Or are we going to blast somebody? But we just don't put their name on it. That way they won't know who did it. You know, they won't know who we're talking about. But our text message should be uplifting. Our, our phone calls should be to affirm people, to invite people, to include people. God wants to include everybody in our world. He wants to do it through you and through me. This is my moment. This is your moment to be an includer. Church, what if this week we became the most inclusive group in this city? Nobody's ever seen it before, a group so inclusive. What if we invited everyone who we didn't want to miss out? I don't want anybody to invite. I don't want any of my friends or acquaintances to go to hell. I'm going to invite them. I'm going to include them. God says, I want my house to be full. What if all of us went out and started inviting our people? Because we didn't want them to miss out. We want them to be on the guest list. We want them to be included. Maybe it starts right now. You start thinking of one or two or three people that you could write their names down. Family and friends and people that God would stir in you right now. You'd write their name down and say, these are the people that I'm going to invite, that I'm going to include this week. You say, well, I invited this guy once before, and they said no. Well, maybe it's time to invite him again. Maybe there are a few people in your world that you've just recently been connected to, and you've, you haven't had an opportunity. Invite them. Maybe there's somebody you know they would say no. They would absolutely say, you've got to be out of your mind. Invite them anyway. Include them. What if we all did this this week? What if we just said, God, use me this week. Use my influence to be an invitation. God, use my life to bring an invitation to people that we know and include them in the family. Think about the change that's about to happen in their lives and of the people that you're about to invite. Think about the impact on their life. Think about the impact on their future. Think about the impact on their family and their children, their grandchildren. Think about the, the new trajectory in their life that instead of teaching their family to go the wrong direction, they can now help guide their family in the right direction. Everything is about to change in the lives of the people you're about to invite. You have to be an includer. I've been included. You've been included. Let's be includers this week. And include somebody. Reach out to somebody. An invitation. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Maybe you have that personality type that's an introvert. You're thinking, oh, talk to somebody. Invite somebody. You know, there are even people that you can invite. Hey, we found this church. You know how I invite people sometimes? I'll say, hey, You've heard of that church over there called Abundant Life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard the pastor's pretty cool. <laughs> we did that at the bowling alley. And her name is Dolly. I said, hey, that preacher over there is pretty good. Then when she found out it was me, she came over there and she goes, okay, I'm going to come visit just to see now. I'm like, yeah, come on. She actually said she, she tried to find us and she couldn't find us. We were nestled in this little neighborhood. And she, she missed us. And so we could keep inviting her. Hey, have you heard about that church over there, Abundant Life? Why don't let's go check it out together? Why don't you come with me? Be an includer. It just might change 
their life. Dear Father, I just pray, oh God, for your church right now, for your people. Lord, I know we're going through issues and we go through problems. We're going through attacks and the arrows of the enemy are hitting us. Lord, let us put up our shield so we would shield off the darts of the enemy, the, the, the fiery darts that come at us. The Lord, we would get in the Word of God and cleanse our minds. The Lord, that your Word would be alive and true in us. The Father, you'd give us the strength and the courage to step out and be an includer and invite somebody to know Jesus Christ. Your heads are still bowed and your eyes are closed. Maybe there's somebody here today that would say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. If I died today, I don't even know if I'd go to heaven. If you're here today and you say, you know what? I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to I follow Jesus. I want my life to be different. I don't want it to continue the way it's going. I want something fresh and new. How many of you say, Pastor, pray for me. Just put your hand up there. I'll pray for you. Yes. Yes. Amen. I see that. I'm going to pray for you. And I want the whole church just to pray this prayer. Pray it with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me make me whole come into my life be my Lord be my master because I believe you died on the cross for me they buried you in a tomb in three days you rose again and right now you're in heaven preparing a place for me I love you and I accept you as my savior in Jesus name Amen